So it's chapter 14. Like school lessons? Yep. Like a hundred specific parts of history that they look at. <coughs> chapter 14. At work the next day, we all notice immediately when the officials enter the room. Like dominoes falling at a game table, head after head turns toward the door of the sorting center. The officials in their white uniforms are here for me. Everyone knows it, and I know it, so I don't wait for them. I push my chair back and stand up my eyes meeting theirs across the dividers that separate our slots. It's time for my test. They nod for me to follow. So I do, heart pounding but head held high, to a small gray room with a single chair and several small tables. As I sit down, Nora appears in the doorway. She seems slightly anxious but gives me a reassuring smile before she looks at the officials. Do you need anything? No, thank you says an official with gray hair, who looks significantly older than the other two. We've brought everything we require. None of the three officials make small talk as they set things in order. The official who spoke first seems to be in charge. The others, both women, are efficient and smooth. They hook up a data tag behind my ear and one inside the neck of my shirt. I don't say anything, not even when the gel they use stings my skin. The two women step back and the older official slides a small screen across the table to me. Are you ready? Yes, I say, hoping my voice sounds level and clear. I straighten my shoulders and sit up a little taller. If I act as though I'm not afraid, maybe they will believe me. Although the data tags they've attached to me t might tell a different story, thanks to my racing pulse. Then you may begin. The first sort is a numbers one, a simple one, a warm-up. They are fair. They want me to get my legs under me before they move on to hard sorts. As I sort the numbers on the screen, making order out of chaos and detecting patterns, my heartbeat evens out. I stop trying to hold on to so many other things. The memory of Xander's kiss, what my father has done, curiosity about Kai, worry about M in the music hall, confusion about myself and how I am meant to be and who I am meant to love. I let it all go, like a child with a handful of balloons on her first day at first school. They float away from me, bright and dancing on the breeze but I don't look up and I don't try to grab them back. Only when I hold on to nothing can I be the best. Only then can I be what they expect me to be. Excellent, the oldest official says as he inputs the scores. Quite excellent. Thank you, Kasha. The female officials remove my data tags. They meet my eyes and smile at me because now they can not be accused of showing any partiality. The test is finished and it seems that I have passed at least. It's been a pleasure, the gray-haired official says, reaching across the small table toward me. I stand up and shake his hand, and then the hands of the other two officials. I wonder if they can feel the current of energy that runs through me. The blood in my veins is made of adrenaline and relief. That was exceptional demonstration of sorting ability. Thank you, sir. On their way out the door, he turns back to me one last time and says, We have our eyes on you now, young lady. He shuts the metal door behind him. It makes a thick, solid sound, a sound of finality. As I listen to the nothing that follows, I suddenly realize why Kai likes to blend in. It is a strange feeling, knowing for certain that the officials watch me more closely. It is as though I stood in the way when that door swung shut and I find myself pinned now by the weight of their observation, a concrete thing, real and heavy. The night of M's match bank, but I go to bed early and fall asleep quickly. It is my night to wear the data tags, and I hope the information they gather for my dreams shows the sleep patterns of a completely normal 17-year-old girl. But in my dream, I'm sorting for the officials again. The screen comes up with M's picture, and I'm supposed to, supposed to sort her into a matching pool. I freeze. My hands stop. My brain stops. Is there a problem? The gray-haired official asks. I can't tell where I should sort her, I say. He looks at M's face on the screen and smiles. Ah, that's not a problem. She has your compact, doesn't she? Yes. She'll carry her tablets to the banquet in it as you did. Simply tell her to take the red one and everything will be fine. What does the red one do? Yeah, it's the one we don't know about yet. So in her dream, remember, this is the dream. In her dream, 
she's told to give M the red tablet, and we don't know what the red tablet does. Suddenly, I'm at the banquet, pushing through girls in dresses and boys in suits and parents in plain clothes. I turn them, shove them, do whatever I have to do to see their faces, because everyone here wears yellow, and it all blurs together. I can't sort. I can't see. I spin another girl around. Not M. I accidentally knock a tray full of cake out of a waiter's hand, trying to catch up with a girl with a graceful walk. The tray falls on the floor and the cake breaks apart, like soil falling from roots. Not M. The crowd thins, and the girl in the yellow dress stands alone in front of a blank screen. M. She's about to cry. It's all right, I call out to her, pushing my way through more people. Take the tablet and everything will be fine. M's eyes brighten. She pulls out my compact. She lifts the green tablet and puts it in her mouth, fast. No, I cry out, too late. The... She puts the blue tablet in her mouth next. Red one, I finish, pushing through the last cluster of pe people to stand in front of her. I don't have one, she says, turning around, her back toward the screen now. She so shows me the open compact, empty. Her eyes are sad. I don't have a red tablet. You can have mine, I say, eager to share with her, eager to help her this time. I won't sit idly by. I pull out my container, twist the top, put the red tablet into her hand. Oh, thank you, Kasia, she says. She lifts it into her mouth. I see her swallow. Everyone in the room has stopped milling about. They all look at us now, eyes on M. What will the red tablet do? None of us knows, except me. I smile. I know it will save her. Behind M, the screen flashes on with her match, right in time for him to see M fall down, dead. Her body makes a heavy sound when it falls, in contrast to the lightness of her eyes fluttering shut, of her dress fluttering in folds around her, of her hands fluttering open like the wings of something small. I wake up sweating and freezing at the same time, and it takes me a minute to calm myself down. Even though the officials have laughed at the notion that the red tablet is a death tablet, the rumors still persist. That explains why I dreamed about it killing M. Just because I dreamed it doesn't mean that it's true. The sleep tags feel sticky on my skin, and I wish I didn't have to wear them tonight. At least the nightmare isn't a recurring one, so I can't be accused of obsessing over something. Besides, I don't think they can tell exactly what I dreamed, just that I did. And a teenage girl having an occasional nightmare can't be uncommon. No one will flag that particular piece of data when it loads to my file. But the gray-haired official said they had their eyes on me. I stare up into the dark with an ache in my chest that makes it hard to breathe, but not hard to think. Ever since the day of Grandfather's final banquet last month, I've gone back and forth between wishing he had never given me that paper and being glad that he did, because at least I have the words to describe what I feel is happening inside of me, the dying of the light. If I couldn't name it, would I even know what it is? Would I even feel it at all? I pick up the microcard that the official gave me in the green space and tiptoe toward the port. I need to see Xander's face. I need reassurance that everything is in order. I stop short. My mother stands at the port screen talking to someone. Who would contact her so late at night? My father sees me from the front room where he sits on the divan waiting for my mother to finish. He gestures for me to come in and sit next to him. When I do, he glances at the microcard in my hands and smiles and teases like any father would. Seeing Xander at school isn't enough? You want to catch another glimpse of him before you go to sleep? He puts his arm around me and gives me a hug. I understand. I was the same way with your mother. That was back when they let us print out a picture from the ports right away instead of making us, making us wait until after our first meeting. What did your parents think of Mama being a farmlander? My father pauses. Well, they were both a little concerned, to be honest. They never thought I'd match with someone who didn't live in a city, but it didn't take them long to decide that they were happy about it. He gets that smile on his face, the one he always gets when he talks about falling in love. It only took that first meeting to change their minds. You should have seen your mother then. Why did you meet in the city instead of in the farmlands, I ask. Usually it's customary for the first meeting to be held close to the girls' home, there's always an official from the match department present to make sure things go smoothly. She insisted on coming here, even though it was a long train ride. She wanted to see the city as soon as possible. 
My parents and the official and I all went to the station to meet her. He pauses, and I know he is picturing the meeting in his, hand, in his mind, imagining my mother stepping off that air train. And I know I sound impatient, but I have to remind him that he's not back in the past. He's here in the present, and I need to know everything I can about the match that made me. When she stepped off the train, your grandmother said to me, she still has the sun on her face. My father pauses and smiles. She did, too. I'd never seen anyone look so warm and alive. My parents never voiced another concern about her again, and I think that we all fell in love with her that day. Neither of us noticed my mother standing in the doorway until she clears her throat, and I with all of you. She seems a little sad, and I wonder if she's thinking of grandma grandfather or grandmother or both. She and my father are now the last two people left who remember that day, except for maybe the official who oversaw their meeting. Who called so late on the port, I ask. Someone from work, my mother says. Looking weary, she sits down next to my father and leans her head on his shoulder as he puts his arm around her. I have to leave on a trip tomorrow. Why? My mother yawns, her blue eyes opening wide. Her face is still sun-kissed from her work outdoors. She looks a little older than usual, and for the first time I see a bit of gray interwoven in her thick blonde hair, some shadows in the sunlight. It's late, Kasha. You should be asleep. I should be asleep. I'll tell you and Bram about it, all about it in the morning. I don't protest. I close my hand over the microcard and say, All right. Before I leave for my room, my mother leans over to give me a kiss goodnight. Once I'm back in my room, I listen through the walls again. Something about my mother leaving right now alarms me. Why now? Where is she going? How long will she be gone? She rarely goes on trips for work. So, my father says in the other room, he's trying to keep his voice quiet. Is everything all right? I can't think of the last time we've had a call so late at night. I can't tell. Something seems to be going on, but I don't know what it is. They're pulling a few of us from other arboretums to come look at a crop at the Arboretum in Grandia Province. Her voice has the sing-song quality that it gets when it's very late, and she's very tired. I remember it from the nights when she used to tell me those flower stories, and I feel reassured. If she doesn't think something is wrong, then everything must be fine. My mother is one of the smartest people I know. How long will you be gone? My father asks. A week at most. Do you think Kasha and Bram will be all right? It's a rather long trip. They'll understand. There's a pause. Kasha still seems upset about the sample. I know. I worry about that. My mother sighs. A soft sound that somehow I still hear through the wall. It was an honest mistake. I hope she sees that soon. Was it a mistake? Mm hmm. Yep. So, what did Kasha just realize now? Her mom doesn't know that he did it on purpose. Mistake. It wasn't a mistake, I think. And then I realize she doesn't know. He hasn't told her. My father has a secret from my mother. And I have a horrible thought. So their match isn't perfect after all. The moment I think it, I want it back. If their match isn't perfect, then what are the chances that mine will be?